people are okay. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'll just get some water. So thanks to Robert and uh, the committee here for giving me the opportunity to share some of the research that we're doing in Nokia that helps inform and inspire the design process. The first thing to note is that there's an hourglass on my presentation. The second thing to note is that actually everything I'm showing you, you know, it's a real privilege to be able to share this, um, but it's all a team effort. And there's a lot of people who are just as qualified to uh, share this with you. The second thing is that what I'm going to show you is not representative in, as in is not representative as the only way that Nokia does design or thinks about design. And the examples that I'm going to show you, um, particularly from places like India and China, I don't think are um, representative of the only experiences that you have in those countries. Um, I've done a lot of emerging markets research, so-called emerging markets. And um, I've also researched a lot with people from relatively low um, income kind of stratas. And um, you know, just as an example, somewhere like India has a bigger middle class than Europe. So, so um, I'm going to show you some examples of things, but just bear in mind it's kind of inspiration um, more than being totally representative. Can we do, turn down the lights a little on the front? You don't need to see me, you just want to see these pictures here. Thank you. The third thing is that actually I'm going through a bit of an identity crisis. And it's something that you can help me with. And the identity crisis I'm having is trying to figure out what it is that I do. And in the kind of spirit of learning and being open to suggestions, I would actually like you to send your answer to what it is that I do um, to Jan Chip. And the person who comes up with the best suggestion, I'm going to stick it on my business card for a year. And I might even send you a little something as well. So what am I? What is it that I do? OK. To put the uh, research that I'm going to show you into some perspective, I need to give you a little bit of statistics about the industry that I work in. So there are 6.6 .6 billion watt. This is going to be interactive, or we're not going to go anywhere. 6.6 .6 billion watt. Cell phones. Good guess. No, 6.6 .6 billion people on the planet, give or take a few hundred million. And there are 4 billion watt. Whoops. <laughs> yeah. OK. And so this, this object that you associate, maybe some of you still associate with people who are kind of in the richer structures of society, is pretty much out there, right? And there are 1 billion watt. Oop, 1 watt. 1 billion, it's, about, it's actually about 1.1 billion, 1.2 billion mobile phones sold every year. And so if you think of getting stuff out there, and if we can affect even small changes in design, or let alone big changes in design, we can hit a large number of people in a very, very short space of time. 16 watt. 16, excuse me, countries, no. Actually, on our uh, entry products, we support, I think it's about 75 um, countries, uh, languages. 16, excuse me? Companies in the business. Companies in the business, yeah, good guess. But no, actually, we make around 16 phones per second, which comes out to a bit more than a million a day, right? And 50,000 watt. Uh, Nokia has, give or take, 50,000 employees. And actually, if you count Nokia Siemens networks, it's uh, more than double that. The point about the last um, statistic is that, you know, essentially, I work for a small town. And in terms of being effective, in terms of doing stuff and making an impact on the, the direction of this town, um, what can I possibly hope to achieve? What can you possibly hope to achieve? And I find it useful to think about the impact that I have in terms of, well, if, you know, if I wanted to have the same impact in the environment that I live in, in the city that I live in, what would I need to do? 
Okay, that's enough perspective. So I'm going to show you Nokia's, what I consider to be Nokia's totally revolutionary um, product. And I've got someone from my communications department over there, and she's probably sweating at this point. And I think this is something that has had a huge impact on the world, um, much more than other things that have been getting a lot more press. And that thing is the simple, cheapest possible cell phone you can get your hands on. And it could be Nokia, it could be a Samsung, it could be a Motorola. There are a lot of companies in this space. But the simple act of putting connectivity into people's hands, um, connectivity in a device that will last, and uh, making it affordable, um, has an incredible impact, and I've seen that firsthand. And I hope to give you some examples and that you'll be able to walk away with a sense of actually how revolutionary this simple object is. I work for Nokia Design, and I, I spent six, seven, eight years in Nokia Research in Tokyo. Um, and Nokia Design is a multidisciplinary team. Um, the team I work within within Nokia Design is an advanced design studio, which is based in LA. And unlike the rest of the organization that has the hard job of making stuff that is shipping out the door, um, I get to think ahead a bit more. I get to think three to 15 years ahead of the market. And my clients internally are not just Nokia Design, but I work a lot with corporate strategy and business development. So we kind of, we're in the organization, but we're facing out. And I think within Nokia Design, we're seeing it seen as a um, kind of fire starters in a way. That we go out there and we figure out what's going on, and we bring ideas in that can disrupt the way that we currently do business. Um, and then also that we're an accelerant. That once we've figured out that an idea really is robust, um, that we help make sure that that idea, that the, the kind of true elements of that idea are communicated throughout the organization. And again, think of the organization as a large, distribute, uh, small distributed town, and the challenge of communicating ideas through the organization. Me personally, this isn't me. Um, me, you might have guessed. Uh, I'm half British, half German. I've spent the last nine years living in Japan, and I'm just in the process of relocating to Los Angeles. You know, and I work for a Finnish company, and I spend a lot of the time traveling. And I'm really intrigued about the clash of kind of where cultures collide, where things kind of meet each other, and the opportunities that come from just recognizing really simple things. And if you've ever tried toasting a tortilla in a toaster, you know they get stuck, right? And chopsticks are just a wonderful thing for getting things out of toasters, as an aside. So Nokia has this philosophy that underpins a lot of where we're coming from, which is about observing then designing. And what that means in practice is that we're a global company. We sell nigh on half a billion product, uh, mobile phone products a year, although we're getting much more um, active in the uh, service space. Um, what it means is that we need to be able to gather data meaningfully in all those contexts in which people do the stuff that they do. And for a company like Nokia, that means um, doing it globally. And it means being able to gather meaningful data from when people get up in the morning to when they go to sleep at night, and pretty much every context in between. And that's kind of what this is about. This is the challenge of this. So it's much easier to talk about the observations than it is the design, because design work tends to be far more confidential. And also, I think that this audience here at Kai is better equipped than most audiences I speak to in terms of taking the things that I'm going to show you and then turning them into things that are actionable. So this is an ob observation-heavy uh, presentation. Maybe like many of you here, um, I started working on kind of application. Um, my background's in uh, UI design and designing applications for PCs. And then moving on to the web. And if you think about kind of human-centered design practices um, for, for uh, this field or, or within that domain, 
And then you think about the challenges of taking that mobile and the huge range of contexts in which we've now got to start gathering data. And, you know, uh, um, I think our research is very strongly associated with mobile phones, and that's understandable because we work for Nokia. If you think three to 15 years out, Nokia may not be in the cell phone business. It might be in a totally different business. 15 years ago, Nokia was making cables and toilet paper and rubber boots. And I know that I work for a company that is able to reinvent itself. Um, so the research that we're doing is not just restricted to desktops and um, fixed spaces. It's not even restricted to mobile. It's restricted. It's kind of, we're interested in everything, and we're interested in everywhere. And all these things are connected, and that creates a huge challenge, um, logistically and also ethically as well, which I'll touch on in a bit. This is my office, broadly speaking. And these are some of the places I just, I started using Doppler, and I, um, I note down, and now I, you know, it's easier to track where I've been. And these are some of the places that I've conducted research in the last three years. And a research study um, for us might be that um, we might, we'll pick a, a theme, and maybe the theme will come from corporate strategy, or it'll come from us, and we say, this is an area that we really need to look into. And then we'll put together a team, and we'll travel to multiple cultures. So for example, um, we might go to Chongqing in China, and Rio de Janeiro, and Milan, to do a comparative study amongst those cultures. And we'll take a team of usually between two and five people from Nokia, often coming from different offices. And on the ground, we will hire anything up to 25 local people in a team, um, often students, sometimes historians, designers. It really depends on what we're interested in. And we'll spend anything from 10 to 14 days in the field. And 14 days seems to be an upper limit of kind of productivity and managing social lives at home and um, not getting divorced and all that kind of stuff. And sometimes, you know, you have challenges like I'm now on first name terms with the um, the uh, customs officials at Ahmedabad Airport, who kindly confiscated all our field equipment on arrival. And I spent two days with my colleagues going through the Indian legal system, trying to get the, the um, stuff released. But once we've got all our equipment and we've got the team together, we basically have you know, between 10 and 14 days of trying to gather as me much meaningful data as possible on the topic that we're interested in. And you know, so take a bunch of people you know who are very well trained, and then take a bunch of people you don't know with training that varies from zero in the field that we're uh, researching in, but they speak English, to um, well-oiled professionals, and get them all up to speed on the thing that you're trying to research, and get them out there, and do it all in a way that is professional um, and proper in all sorts of things moral, ethical sense, um, and delivers value to your company. And that's kind of the challenge that we have. This is my colleague, Yang Ching, who I wish could be here today. One of the things that I found useful is um, when we uh, choose a hotel or a guest house, obviously, we're, we're trying to be in the communities that we're in. And I think there's a real pressure when you work for, a, particularly when you work for a corporation, that here's a list of major chain hotels, and this is where you're going to stay, and everything's taken care of. We really kind of put a lot of effort into being situated as well as we can in the communities that we're researching in. Sometimes we go to the point where we live with people, although that comes with a whole different set of challenges. A little tip that um, I found useful is that for the local team, we offer to put them up in the guest house or hotel. And they think it's a treat, usually. But we know it just means that we've got them 24-7 on call to work them as hard as we want to, which is what we're there for. Occasionally, we get it wrong a little bit, or we kind of um, we re figure out the boundaries of how we should be working. This is from a study that we did in South Korea, in Seoul, looking at mobile TV. And um, 
the accommodation that we were staying in is, it ran out, and the, the only kind of available and suitable accommodation that we could find was a love hotel. And love hotels are these hotels that you book by the hour, usually. So what we learned from this is, um, love hotels have very good bathing facilities. Love hotels have very dim lighting, generally. In South Korea, they have excellent internet connectivity. And um, the downside is they can be quite noisy. Uh, claiming your receipts for expenses can be a little bit problematic. And also, you know, after a hard day in the office and you've done all your interviews and you're shadowing and you're contextual stuff and you're standing in the elevator and you've got your tripod and there's me, that Chinese colleague you saw, and my colleague Young here, and we're standing in the elevator with all the recording equipment and a nervous couple walks in and we're riding the elevator up to our rooms and, you know, it's, you end up in these kind of quite poor social situations. There's also a thing where, um, you know, as much as possible, companies like to, particularly in the kind of SOX compliance um, world, companies need to be accountable for where the money goes and where it gets spent. And a lot of the places where we were researching, we had the challenge that, well, actually, you know, you can't always pay by credit card and you can't purchase things in advance. And um, how, you know, how do you balance the needs of the corporation, the legal requirements of the corporation, with actually getting the work done as well? And you know, we, we usually hire a local accountant to help us through this minefield, but we do end up in these situations where usually at the end of the study, you know, we've got the wages of 25 people, and we've got to pay the hotel, and sometimes we even book the entire hotel, and so we just take over the whole hotel. So we've got all of this, and we've got to pay for it, so there's usually a day at the end of the study where everyone is sitting around having a party and there's me and the accountant and someone else and we're sitting in a room and we've just got this a bed full of cash and I always wonder what you know what it would be like if the piece, police burst through the door and just saw all this money and the recording equipment and um, kind of it looks a little bit like mission control as well because by the end of the study we got maps on the wall and we got user profiles and you know where we've been and, and all this kind of stuff. So I think at the heart of the research that we do is um, kind of home-based or st a lot of the research that we do starts in people's homes. And as many of you will recognize, that's an incredibly rich environment from which to, to uh, work. And just, you know, if you work for a, uh, a company of 50,000 people and, and we have customers in, in, a, uh, in cities like Mumbai and this is a place called Dharavi in Mumbai, which some of you may have seen in um, the film Slumdog Millionaire, and um, which it featured in that movie. But you know, we have customers already, existing cu customers in, in those uh, environments, and yet we know, we know actually relatively little about them. And just simple things like, and if you could turn the lights right down for this, please. Thank you. So you know, this is a home for four people and it's about six meters square, and you know, they have uh, intermittent electricity, they have uh, intermittent water, there's a public toilet outside, and you know, there's things that we need to and want to understand about this family and about, how, about their lives. And the challenge that we have, you know, in those 10 to 14 days, how do you meaningfully engage with people who, um, you know, I, I earn more in a few days than they do in a year. Right? How do you do that? And yeah, and then how do you communicate that to uh, the organisation that you work for? So anyway, immersions are a big part of um, this research. Another thing is just simply understanding and getting a sense of the city, of the environment. We're not just interested in them and their mobiles. We're interested in the broader context. A really simple thing that we do is wherever we go we have one day where we just get up at about four or five o'clock and we just wake up with the city and we find a neighborhood and we walk around. And that's a really easy way to get up to speed on certain aspects of a culture without, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't take much preparation to do. We consume a lot of media. We go out and we buy what people buy. We listen to what they listen to. This is from Kabul in Afghanistan. You know, this is a showreel for a warlord. Um, but you can, you can, purchase things like this and you can look at the quality of the encoding, the quality of the editing, the, the distribution channels. 
And that also tells you something about the environment that you're in. We also try and use services, local services, as much as possible. And this is from Lhasa in Tibet. And it's a photo booth. And actually, photo, um, almost every community has someone who documents people in that community. And often it's for ID purposes. But then they can be very, um, uh, you, can, you also get a sense of how people like to express themselves. And you also get a sense of technology adoption. So something I've seen a lot in China is people who are printing out pictures without ever going through a PC. You know, they just buy a direct. They're the people who are doing the director um, printer printing. Um, and in some ways, you know, our ways of, I think what we see a lot is that people are just leapfrogging. They're, they're kind of getting rid of stuff that we go through to deliver something of value to them. If you have 25 people at your disposal, it becomes relatively easy to run street surveys. And okay, a lot of people here will know the limits, the pros and cons of running street surveys. But one of the things that we do with the street surveys is we take pictures. And we always ask permission, and we get, data, we get written data consent. Um, but we take pictures of people and their devices. And when you're trying to communicate everything else that you're doing in your study, Having access to a data bank of um, up to 10 pictures of 300 people just really enables you to enrich um, the other work that you're uh, doing. And also, again, it gives you a sense of kind of local norms. We also take prototypes, so software and hardware prototypes, into the field. This is um, one of our designs that um, we're iterating in the field in uh, Ghana, in Accra. Um, and we use the d uh, physical prototypes as stimulus material. And then back at the um, guest house, we're iterating the design. In the last year, actually, uh, or so, um, we experimented with setting up design studios in shanty towns. Um, so we set up four design studios to run for up to two weeks. And we invited uh, members of the community to come into the studio um, to work on a particular design challenge. And we were doing it partly um, because uh, we were interested in the designs that they would come up with, but partly to see, um, to explore kind of nonverbal ways of people expressing um, their preferences or their ex expressing the w their way of viewing the world. The, challenge with any co-creation, I think particularly working with a, in a corporation, is um, you know, who owns what's created? And there's the legal answer, and then there's the right answer in terms of you know, you know, what's morally right. And those, those two are not usually, uh, are not necessarily the same. Um, and then there's the kind of practical answer. Even if someone does own the rights to what they create, in practical terms, it might be impossible for them to exploit it. And, you know, and as a large corporation, again, going into these communities, um, you know, how do we tread the line between engaging people in a meaningful way and coming away with something of value but not exploiting? A lot of the um, data that we collect, and we collect interview transcripts, we collect movies, artifacts, um, and a lot of photographs. Um, in fact, from a single study, it's quite easy to turn out. So one city, 10 days, 15,000 photos um, from a study. And a lot of what we collect you know, it ends up being pretty intimate, right? And the intimacy is a challenge, because on the one hand, it suggests authenticity. But on the other hand, it misses part of the point, which is that actually we've gone in there, and we've started affecting the situation. And you know, as researchers, we wonder about, you know, we have methods where we are purely observing, and then we do methods where we're really kind of not trying to affect the situation, but they know we're there. Um, and then we have methods that we're directly engaging. You know, and as researchers, what is our responsibility to our organization to communicate where stuff is coming from? When you're out there, 
you have very little control over the environment, right? And um, you know, we've dealt with overflowing sewers in India to typhoons in China, off the coast of China. Um, and we also often come up against the kind of boundary between what's legal and not, not legal. And sometimes we're working in communities where, um, well, the police or the authorities really don't get a look in. And that's also a real minefield in how to operate in that environment. And yeah, this is, um, I met someone, uh, Karen, are you here? Anyway, I met uh, someone from my first Kai conference many years ago, um, here, uh, just five minutes ago. And I've submitted a couple of papers to Kai and got rejected. They were probably crap anyway. And it's kind of nice to be back. So. But um, to be honest, I really am not interested in academic publishing whatsoever. And um, maybe I'm not particularly qualified to do it either. Um, but there is a huge audience for the stuff that we do outside our environment. An audience that you can engage with meaningfully and um, get stim you know, really stimulating material back. And I think a big part of the work that we do is actually going out there and making the effort to engage. And so if I'm ever in your city, you know, I would love to engage with you. And I think partly the, I mean, this is something that troubles me but also intrigues me, is that um, the work that we do is filled with stories. You know, I've told you a couple of them here. And stories, and stories about people, you know, they're just, that's the essence of what it means to be human. And it is also the, the thing that helps sell newspapers and TV programs and so on. And a lot of what we do is actually, even if we don't design it as such, it's actually very media friendly. And I think increasingly, the work that we do is picked up by the media. And it's a double-edged sword, right? Because at what point do you become a media, excuse me, a media whore? Or at what point does the work that you do become biased or driven by the media, right? Anyone who does anything with the media um, needs to be aware of that. And, but at the same time, when the person that you've been trying to influence within your organization opens up their newspaper or listens to their radio station and they see you in it, and they see the work that you've done in it, that's when they start knocking on your door. And it just makes so many of the conversations that much easier. So, yeah, media. It's a double-edged sword, but I think it's an interesting and necessary part of certainly what I do. And maybe it's, you know, you really need to think about what it could do for you. So I'm going to give you a few of the light observations, some of the things that help inform our view of how the world will turn out. Um, some of the stuff is just purely inspirational, and some of it is, um, I think, replicable um, in the kind of more scientific sense of the word. So this is a, um, a sign from China, and it's in the, uh, around the time of the SARS um, issue, um, and it's bilingual. And one of the things, uh, it's bilingual and it's don't spit. And at the top it says, I think, uh, by all, uh, somewhere it says by, by the authority of whichever health authority. So signs are kind of intriguing in whichever culture you're in, in terms of getting your cultural bearings, in that signs tell you about particularly do not signs or do signs. They tell you about where a society is or some aspect of society. Um, and then they tell you about where it wants to go, right? And so um, the don't spit tells you that at least one person is spitting and it's, a, and it's an issue to some people and it wants to move to somewhere else. And you can, if you apply the same kind of reasoning to um, all the signs that you come across, so. We did a study in Tehran, and we arrived quite late, and we were just trying to stretch our legs, and we went into a local park. And it was quite a large park in northern Tehran, and there were two signs in the entire park. One, one sign said, do not drink this water, and the other sign said, 
drink this water. Right? So again, with the kind of signs, what is the lack of signs saying, do not walk your dog without a leash? No adults without an accompanying child. You know, think of all those signs that if I go into a park in the UK, there'll be a dozen of them. In the US, you'll probably have a dozen and a half signs. And then when you go into the child enclosure, there'll be another dozen signs. So again, what does the lack of signs or the number of signs or the type of signs tell you about the society? And tell you about how a society articulates itself or the relationships within a society? Does not having the signs mean that in fact it's just such common knowledge or that people get along so well that they're not, you know, they're very mindful of each other? Or does it tell you that it's just, you know, they haven't got the times to make them? And, um, does it mean they're ahead or behind on the kind of sign evolutionary scale? This is a poster from uh, the uh, kind of uh, one of the communities in Accra in Ghana. And it's a poster, you said they were quite common. It's a poster for people who've died. And it's announcing the funeral. And you'll have a huge list of people. So you, you often have these things there. Call to glory, it'll have their real name, and then it'll have the, the other names that they were known by. Um, it will have ages. And I'm not quite sure what the, uh, uh, the life expectancy in Ghana is, but I, I know it's not 110 years. And it will have well-wishers and people who are invited. And this, this sign is an encapsulation of um, kind of so many things within that culture, um, both in terms of what people want to project and the ties that they wish to um, communicate. The next time you open a newspaper or you go online, check out the obituaries and look at what people are writing about the people who have passed away. Some of the things we see are just hugely basic. So this is a, uh, a weighing scale from Tokyo. So Tokyo has um, its own kind of uh, numbering. Uh, you know, and yet here we have it in um, kind of uh, uh, regular numbering here. Excuse me. And here's another example, a very simple example from Iran. You know, these are just basic examples of, um, if you're, for example, designing a service, uh, are you doing text left to right? What are the exceptions to when you're using this or that? And so we're, you know, on a very basic level, we're collecting this kind of data. This is from my neighborhood in Tokyo, in a place called Sanganjaya. And um, this sign means shrine. So, um, but it's not a shrine. So it's in an area with lots of bars. My question to you is, why would anyone write the word shrine on a wall? I'm not going on until someone answers. So why would any, anyone write the word shrine on a wall? You, sir. So people don't urinate or spit. Spot on, sir. So. OK, I mean, so what does this tell you about the respect that people have for um, religious authority? And um, I gave a, a talk in, um, at a school, high school in South Central LA uh, a couple of days ago. And they were saying, you know, the, the same thing in, in South Central is if you have a picture of MLK, Martin Luther King, or Christ on the wall, it has the same effect. And I've seen the same thing in India as well. So that's an example of something that is, you know, people using these symbols in particular ways. Sometimes we come across things that we can't quite explain. This is from Sao Paulo. And you can see it's a kind of pedestrian area. And there's a whole bunch of people who are wearing these signs. And here are three of them. They're actually advertising jobs. And in Sao Paulo, if you want a, um, a clerical job, especially, you go up to these guys, and you go up to this community, and there's just dozens and dozens of people you know, advertising jobs in this way, and you can go directly up to them, and they'll tell you about the jobs that are being advertised. Can anyone tell me what this is? Gasoline, excellent. Where is it? 
Indonesia, good guess. It's uh, Vietnam, very close. So this is an example of, you know, we all have an idea of what a gas station is, right? You know, it's this big thing, and you've got the pumps, and they'll sell chewing gum, and they'll sell this and that. And I think particularly in places like Indonesia, and in uh, Vietnam, and Mongolia, we see designs of things stripped down to their, if you'll excuse the half pun, their essence. So what we see here is a brick, a bottle, and uh, a tube. So why is it on a brick? Why does it even need a brick? What, is, what function does the brick serve? Perfect. And such a loud voice as well. Thank you. If you elevate the bottle, um, basically, water flows down, right? And you can get it into the, the tank of, uh, um, of particularly the motorcycles. And it's mostly motorcycles that are stopping here. And, you know, this is, this is a gas station, right? It's really difficult to get less than this in terms of an experience. And designers, I think, particularly, are really kind of for want of a better word, turned on or inspired by kind of things reduced to their essence. And it could be the essence of human behavior, or it could be the essence of um, design. And I think once you know what the essence is, it then allows you to build it up again, and build it up in new ways, and, and, and kind of differentiate the offering. This is a truck from, again, my, my neighborhood in Tokyo. And uh, what happens is it drives around. I see someone nodding. So where are you from, sir? Where are you from? To Tokyo? Yeah, OK. So much. Uh, so this drives around in Tokyo. And you put your magazines out on your doorstep. And the guys with the truck, they come around and they pick up your magazines for recycling. And when they pick it up, they leave recycled toilet paper, pa uh, toilet paper that's made from recycled uh, paper. And they leave that on your doorstep. And I think that's a really kind of beautiful, again, really simple cycle where, you know, action, reaction, right? Um, really, somehow, a very pure design. Some of the places we go to, we see stuff where, you know, people are basically trying to overcome the limitations of their environment. And yeah, you can, you can say that you see that everywhere, but maybe it's more obvious in places like Uganda. Um, and Kampala has very frequent power cuts. And there's guys on the street, and they're basically offering to charge your mobile phone. You know, it's, that's part of the service that they offer. It's actually not that cheap. And here's an example from Kabul in Afghanistan. And so why are the light bulbs on the front of the store? Show they have power, exactly. So. How do you prove that you can offer the service that you offer? And how do you do it in a physical, in the physical realm? You know, people can test it and they can bend it. And how do you prove that you can offer the ability to charge? Well, you can do that by having lights at the front. That shows you have electricity, right? And if you then extrapolate that, well, how do you prove that the service that you're offering is in fact capable of offering that service? This is um, another example from Dharavi in Mumbai, at the Shanti town. And it's at the entrance of a tea house. And um, you have a cup of chai. And on your way out, you pass the gentleman who's sitting on a stool, the proprietor. You hand him your cash. And he takes the cash. And he just rubs his hand against this religious icon and then deposits the cash. In effect, he's blessing every single transaction that goes through his cash register. And I think particularly you know, coming from the usability side and then also thinking on the mobile space, we're really trying to strip things down. But at what point is it worth, or should we, or can we introduce kind of more um, ethereal elements into the design process that users will value? So this is from um, Afghanistan again, and it's um, Eti Salat, an advertisement. And Etisalat, I think it's, yeah, it has the prefix 786, which has a particular uh, significance in the Muslim faith. And the prefix 
means if you have an Etisil apps phone, kind of in one way or another, every call on that network is blessed if you're Muslim and you believe in it. This is from Tehran. If you've ever been to Tehran, and I would strongly recommend it, it's a, um, Iran's a beautiful country, um, you'll notice that there are shared taxis running around the streets. And one thing about shared taxis is when you get in, there'll be other people sitting in there, you negotiate with the driver, this is where I want to go, and they say yes or no, right? And so the um, uh, Tehranian um, uh, authority basically came up with a taxi meter that supports four people. So, so you have these kind of interesting artifacts. But what's interesting about this is not just that it exists and tr someone tried to formulate, formalize this kind of process in terms of this object, but really that nobody really uses the taxi meter because most people who step into the taxi think that they can get a better deal by negotiating directly with the driver. So this is just symbolic. In the same way that if you go in, in Delhi and there's the meter and they'll switch it on so they don't get busted by the cops, but it's a joke, right? It's just, it's, it's symbolic. This is a taxi in Chongqing in China. It's, how many people here have heard of Chongqing? Okay, there's a few hands up. Chongqing is either the biggest or one of the biggest cities in the world. I love, I love China in the, in the sense that I can go to cities that you know, really I, I know very little about and they've got 10 million people in them. It's, it's that kind of country. So in Chongqing, the taxis um, have seat covers and on each seat cover is written the day of the week. And by and large, if you go in on a Thursday, they'll have a cover which says Thursday. And it's just one way that the taxis are trying to differentiate themselves from the bus services and other transport services by um, showing how clean they are, because the assumption is that if they put a new cover on every day and it's being washed, then this is a clean environment. And I think particularly in somewhere like rural uh, and kind of business site uh, China, um, that's a real uh, differentiator. I'm also kind of, the team spends quite a bit of time trying to understand behaviors and how behaviors evolve and your kind of behavioral mimicry as well. And also the kind of boundaries through which, or the lenses through which, or the filters through which, we figure out what is the right behavior. Again, this is from Tokyo, and of the entire apartment block, and this is kind of the way I cycle to work, to our office, the entire apartment block, the two people that consistently put their mattresses out to air every day are the ones that stand next to each other. And when you're on the balcony, the only person that you can see is your neighbor, right? Your immediate left or right neighbor. And for me, this is indicative of how people le learn and the kind of how we blinker ourselves as well. There was a time when wearing headphones was seen as utterly revolutionary. You know, it was just so, so odd to wear headphones in public. And I think we've probably all here had an experience of coming across someone who's speaking to someone and we think they're speaking to us or they're speaking to themselves and they look very smart, but they're really using a headset of some sort, and particularly Bluetooth headsets. And what interests me, and something that we really spend a lot of time on, is looking at the behaviors that people have um, when they're bringing, when new objects are brought out into the world. And this is not a good example, but there we go. So the kind of, when objects become particularly beyond a certain size where other people cannot see what's going on, there's a real fa fascinating dance in the way that people over extenuate what it is that they're doing to communicate to people around them, this is what I'm doing. This is an example from a cafe where it wasn't really okay to take a work call, but by cupping this and by whispering into it, it wasn't, I was trying to communicate to um, the staff that in fact, yes, I'm aware of what I'm doing and I know it's not right, but I'm gonna try and keep it down and I'll try and keep it short as well. And we've, we've done a lot of um, studies on, for example, laptop behavior in public spaces and the way that, you know, opening this thing up, it really strikes the, if you're an independent cafe owner, that strikes the fear into you. That's, 
lost revenue, right? This is from rural Uganda, and it's an address book um, of sorts for the community. And it's, it wasn't designed as such, but it's an example of an interesting artifact, I think. So when people uh, come to the phone kiosk, and it's a, actually a phone kiosk with a mobile phone, and they come to make a call, if they're um, illiterate, often they will come with a small scrap of paper with the number written on. And the phone kiosk operator could dial the number and call. But the problem is that there's too many errors. So they end up dialing the wrong number because it's transcribed incorrectly. And then they get into a fight with the person who's um, wanting to make the call. And so what the, um, the operators tend to do is they write down the number on a piece of paper. And they get the illiterate person or the person to then confirm this is the number that they wish to call. And once they have that confirmed, then uh, they actually make the call itself. So it's kind of intriguing. I mean, we've done probably three, four years of research into illiterate communication practices, and we've put a lot of it out in the public domain, and really trying to understand how illiterate people communicate and navigate the world around them. And we were fascinated to see that uh, the extent to which people are, illiterate people particularly, are able to do really complex tasks um, like making a phone call, and the extent to which they rely on are able to draw on other people out there, the ecosystem, to actually get stuff done. Another really simple example that you've probably come across is that if I wish to send someone a text message but they don't have a phone, you just send a text message to the nearest person with a phone, and one of their buddies will then run off and deliver it on foot, right? And so instead of text messaging, we call this um, step messaging. And you can find, you can take any piece of technology that people do not have access to, and they can, they can get many of the benefits of that technology, may, maybe not with the level of immediacy, or the level of convenience, or level of privacy, but they can have access to a lot of the, the, com, uh, the functionality of the resources. Um, and we kind of call that, it's either proximate literacy or proximate technology, which is, I don't own it, but I know someone who does. And often, you know, when you think of really complex design uh, challenges, um, you, can, uh, you can have levels of adoption that are far higher than the number of devices that you're selling, simply because there are networks that are connecting to the people that you're selling to. One of the things we learned from um, our research into illiterate communication practices is that illiterate people are just super smart. And I would say that they're smarter than most of you, and definitely they're smarter than me. And they actually have something in common with incredibly wealthy people. So if you're really wealthy, you tend to have an assistant. And you know, you tell your assistant to call up that other person, and when you're connected, they just hand you the phone, right? And illiterate people are kind of similar. There's a load of stuff that they can't do on the phone because they're not literate, but they just get other people to do it. And not that they see it as delegation, but from a kind of design or task flow point of view, it pretty much is delegating. And it turns out, I think, that delegation is the answer to a lot of design problems, which is, I can't do it. I just don't ask someone else to do it. And I think we started seeing this coming back to um, people like yourselves, where when the cost of communicating with someone within your social network is so low that um, it's trivial, then it's just easy to ask them for stuff and not impinge them upon them. And a, and a really simple one is just asking people, where are you? Uh, sorry, asking people, where am I? Or how do I get to? So how many people have used Twitter here? How many people have asked a Twitter question, a question on Twitter to a whole bunch of people that you, you know, essentially don't know that well? Okay, that's delegation, right? And once you get those communication tools in in the mass market um, to not only your entire social network but to pretty much everyone out there, you can start really distributing kind of task flows to lots of different people. Okay, this is one of the, um, I've only got a few more slides left. Uh, this is an example from 
a favela in Rio de Janeiro, taken one by, by one of our design team. And on the right, you will see an electricity meter. So, um, in the, uh, and on the left, you will see a, what's called a cat's claw, a, a gato. And so, if you pay someone from your neighborhood to set this up, a few bucks, you'll get all your electricity for free when it's running, right? No electricity bills, wonderful. And on the right, you have an official meter and you get a monthly bill. And a really simple question for you is, why would anyone pay a monthly bill if you get all your electricity for free? Yes? Perfect. It gives you an address. It's a piece of paper from an official organization that other people recognize that says, this person of this name lives at this address, or more often than not, lives somewhere in relation to this address, right? So what's interesting about this is that you know, we design systems, and we, design, you know, we really try and anticipate ways in which people use those systems. But actually, people are incredibly smart. And I really have um, absolute faith in people that they will figure out the right way to engage in the systems that, that, that we design. And yeah, you know, that's kind of fundamental. Do we need to design everything, right? And they know the trade-offs of that. You know, the trade-off of having this piece of paper that proves your identity is, in fact, a small monthly bill. But you can use that piece of paper. You can go to the bank and you can get a credit card or open a bank account. This is something we've seen uh, a fair amount, and particularly in communities where um, the community itself does not appear on any official maps of the area. So places like streets that literally don't have names, right? And instead of seeing house numbers on homes, we're starting to see mobile phones written there, mo mobile phone numbers. So what does it mean when you grow up that instead of having this kind of fixed point of reference, I think most people here grew up with, um, you know, your home address was that kind of fixed point of reference. What does it mean when it starts to come more mobile? And on the theme of identity, so this is taken from Ghana. And another topic that we've researched a lot, and um, we gave a, a small talk at MIT this morning about um, street hacks, like how people are hacking the stuff that we're designing in ways that we couldn't and didn't anticipate. And in, a, in countries like Ghana, um, people will often have multiple SIM cards um, from different operators because it's cheaper to call within an operator than to call outside an operator. So if you want to call your friend who's on another operator, uh, you'll probably, if you call them enough, you'll buy a second SIM card, and then you'll put that in, you'll make the call, because it shaves a few cents off the call costs. And remember, this is in communities where people are incredibly price sensitive. There are other reasons for having multiple SIMs. Another one is um, to wanting to separate work and social life. Um, a third one is that actually your operator may not have coverage over the entire country. So people are carrying around multiple SIMs. They can't necessarily afford to have two phones, so they're taking one phone, they take the battery out, they stop it. And it's a process that takes about a minute to do, right, and reboot the phone. So. In Ghana, in Accra, um, there's a service that you can go to, and you can buy, you see this metal sleeve? That's shaped like a SIM card, and you can buy that. And the guys in the shop, they will take two of your SIM cards, the equivalent of your Verizon and your AT&T card. They will peel away the plastic, and they will take the circuitry, and they will press that circuitry and connect it to this little sleeve. You put this new SIM card into your phone, your GSM phone, and it will switch between two operators automatically without rebooting the phone. All right? And that's, okay, it, that's fascinating on so many different levels. That's fascinating on the level of, okay, there's a consumer des demand for something, and they've figured out a way around the, the restrictions of companies like ourselves or the operators. So it's an incredibly innovative space. It's fascinating that it's on the streets of Accra, not on the streets of Boston. And something that we've learned is um, 
this kind of street hack culture, particularly with mobile phones, is so developed that if you find an innovation um, in, um, let's say, MIT to do with mobile phones, uh, within, uh, you know, on Monday, on Friday, it'll be in Lagos. If someone's able to commercialize it, they will commercialize it. And we're dealing with things that are so small that actually even in very poor neighborhoods, it's worthwhile for someone to go in out and order a thousand of them, you know, if they're an entrepreneur, and FedEx them over from wherever it is that they're made, and it's probably made in China, right? And the ubiquity of mobile phones, the one point something billion phone products per year, the ubiquity of the number of people who are actually using them, the four billion plus people, means that this is an incredibly vibrant space in which people are innovating. So the opening slide uh, was this picture, and it was taken in a bar in um, Chengdu, um, one of my favorite bars, um, called The Little Bar. And um, I've, I've been trying to figure out what it is that I do, right? And for me, this kind of sums up some of it, which is that there's just an incredibly vibrant life out there. And how do we engage with it in a meaningful way? And what can we take away from it? And how do we capture it? You, know, you have this lady, I don't know if you can see it, this lady who has a zoom lens and she's just focused in on, actually a part of this gentleman's anatomy, but you know, it's, I don't know, I, I, I'm not really, you know, this is the kind of closing point. So I, like, where's your passion in what you do? And how do you bring that into the organization? And that's something I struggle with, and this picture reminds me of that. Maybe it's not that articulate. So I started with the question of what am I? And I'm really open to actually you telling me what it is that I do, because I sure as hell don't know. Um, but it's really a question about what are you? And that's really what this is about, is what are you and what do you need to become to move from um, fixed location to mobile to researching out there? in a world where everything's connected. And that's it. Thank you very much. I guess, uh, questions? Oh, what's the? OK, uh, questions, if anyone has questions. Um, sir? Hi, uh, Brian Glucroft, Microsoft China. Hello. Um, I'm really curious about your experience in both doing research, doing these 14 day deep dives into different cultures, and you're also living in a very different culture, or were, in Japan. I was wondering what lessons from living in Japan, having that long term experience, how has that guided you into how you do those 14 day trips? And what sort of does it tell you about what you might miss in that 14 day trip and how you try to compensate for that? I mean, if you don't live somewhere, how can you possibly have an understanding of it, right? And that, that was, in fact, one of my motivations for moving to Japan was to challenge what I knew, which was mostly European-based. Um, I think what inspires me about Japan is that in many ways it's on the technological cutting edge. You know, I can use my mobile phone to make payments, and it's, it's my TiVo if I want it to be literally. Um, and I can use it on the subway and so on. You know, technology-wise, it's, it's out there. And that gives you a particular set of emerging kind of uh, practices that are worth, uh, that are, are an interesting perspective. Um, but as I hope I've shown a little bit, I think some of the cutting edge is actually in places where people have next to nothing. And they're just using some of the things that we're putting out there to in reinvent in ways that we really hadn't anticipated. Does that answer your question? No? OK, sorry. <laughs> Next. <laughs> I'm up here, right? So I can choose. Hi, I'm Amanda sorry. Williams from UC Irvine. I noticed you ended your talk by saying that we're in a world that's globally connected. And as someone who works at a transnational and travels all over the place, you're going to see that and experience that in a certain way. So I'm actually wondering, how do you talk to your participants about this, and how do they see themselves fitting into these sort of transnational flows of imports and exports and people and ideas? 
So that's a, that's a very good, uh, smart question. So um, actually, the, you know, we live in a connected world, right? And okay, the, the thing that we noticed maybe five years ago is that at that point in the process where we started taking out recording equipment, people would, you know, the participants would start taking out their recording equipment and start recording us, right? So that's the first thing. And I think that's, that's actually really powerful in itself. This kind of the scary thing or the thing that we really need to negotiate now is that when we go somewhere, um, the people that we interact with have access to our Facebook profiles, um, our web page, I write a blog, you know, called um, youngchipchase.com. Um, you know, or, or, you know, they can go to the Flickr stream, whatever. And, you know, that, in many ways, that keeps us on a, it, it creates a very different relationship. So one of the, um, you know, we're interested in everything. And a big question about what we do is, where do we stop? And one of the things that we try to do is that whenever we do kind of really deep dives, we work on the assumption that every single piece of digital data that we collect from a family or an individual will be given to them in a format that they want, either printed out or um, increasingly they want it in a digital format. And it works as a memento, but it really works, it's, you know, you can tell your team, this is what we're, these are the boundaries of what we're doing and these are the ethics of what we're doing. But if they know that the family that you're gonna interacting with is gonna see the pictures that you're taking, that's the biggest frame. And I think that's, it's part of the whole same thing. And if anything, it keeps us um, on the right side of where we need to be, right? So, does that answer? Okay, my name's Jack Beaton. I'm also from Nokia, and I also recently spent uh, a month in a developing country doing research, but I'm in services, and we're not thinking three years to 15 years ahead. We're thinking at much, like at best, we're maybe five minutes behind. Uh, so <laughs> what that means is we already have designs that need work being done, and the designers are really busy. They have maybe 15 minutes to read our three months of research. Yeah. Uh, so what sort of advice do you have for us? So first of all, hey, hi. How many Nokia people are there in there? Hey. Hi, guys. Hey, hey. So I think um, stories sell, right? I mean, story, stories is just, storytelling is, is just human nature. And without wanting to oversimplify what it is that we do, I think if you can make a compelling story, that will cut through It'll cut through a lot of what they're receiving. I, I always assume that of the work that we do, um, the person who's going to receive an email that says, look, this is what we've done, they're going to have 500 other emails in their inbox that are competing for their time, and they have access to every single analyst report that has ever been published on that subject, right? So why the hell should they read anything that I read? And you know, that, that's an incredibly complex situation, but I think um, putting data into the right format, we spend a huge amount of time actually listening to what people want and then um, remolding what we have to actually put it in the format that they want. And quite simply, stories sell as well. Uh, hello, <clears throat> my Hi. name is Kyle Drexel and I work for Microsoft. And I have had the uh, opportunity to conduct some ethnographic field research myself. And I, I was, uh, I paid particular pen, uh, attention to the photo of the individual holding the modded SIM card. And it made me wonder, to what degree do you operate openly as a employee of Nokia versus a research team from an unknown origin? So in other words, to what degree do you work blindly out there as a agent to versus disclose your yeah. affiliation? OK, yeah. that's, a, that's another good question. And in fact, if you fast forward that five years when I can look at any one of you and you'll have a little bubble over your head that tells me what your salary is and who you work for and your affiliation, it's going to become even more uh, pertinent. So um, we do research that ranges from simple observations, where we, have, we do not disclose at all, to being upfront about who we are. I think we err on the side of transparency, and I know that comes with a whole bunch of inherent biases. We don't just rely on our research, we rely on many different techniques, some of which from companies which, who will be kind of more anonymous and will have less biases. So, 
Thomas Hansen from Aarhus University. Uh, I'm really interested in after kind of spending time in a, in China, coming back to Nokia, ha having to hand off this really really rich experience. How how do you do it? Do you make presentation, long reports? Uh, how how do you really get this rich experience to the to the designers back home? Yeah, how do you take how do you create value with what you do, right? So. Um, as much as possible, you in involve them in the process of actually gathering the data, and often we're taking designers into the field. Um, often they're the people coming to us and saying, this is, you know, this is what we want you to research. Um, so they're, they're stakeholders in that sense. I think, um, may, you know, to cut through a lot of the crap, essentially, I, just what are people interested in? And start from there. And people are interested in stories about other people. Um, they're interested in how other people live. Um, and these are things that really work in your favor when it comes to actually pitching the message that you want to deliver, right? I mean, we do all the UX reports and workshops mm -hmm. and blah de blah de blah but I think, I think you guys assume that anyway, so next. Hi, uh, my name is Shitaj Anand, and uh, I'm a documentary photographer and a grad student at Indiana University. Uh, you talked in one of your slides about uh, the challenge of intimacy and uh, intrusiveness, and just kind of curious as to like, does being at a you know corporation like Nokia put you at an added advantage of dealing with issues like ethics and you know like how you present other people's story to the world and whether you have faced any challenge as such. Because I deal with that like quite often, you know, being an independent photographer, like you don't have that advantage of just going to anybody and doing research on them. So, okay. It, so this is a question of um, ethics and like how do you deal with like you know in doing a research, like how do you deal with like at being at Nokia as compared to doing it independently? Okay. Probably shouldn't say this at an academic conference. Have you ever gone to a bar to try and pick someone up? <laughs> All right. So if you've ever been in, anyone who's ever been in a situation where you've tried to make yourself, you know, attractive to someone of the opposite sex, it's about understanding motivation. And I think you take away the sex, but you, if you're out there and you're trying to figure out what is people, what are people's motivations? And, um, okay, we, we used to run street surveys where we really didn't think it was possible to get data consent for the photos that we were collecting. And we would collect photos, but we just would be very strict about how they were used in the company because of the, the limits. Of, we have verbal consent, but not written. And then we started asking um, people, I think it was in, in um, Uganda, we started putting in a written data consent. So, you know, we'd walk up to a complete stranger, essentially, and say, I'm from Nokia, I'm doing a survey on blah, blah, blah. Um, can I ask you a few questions? And, oh, would you mind if my photographer takes some photos? At the end of the process, they get a chance to delete any photos, and, and then they would sign the data consent. We have a 99.9999% success rate. Um, and I think if everyone in your team, and this is particularly difficult when you have an extended team with people that you haven't worked with much, if everyone knows where you're coming from and knows the boundaries of what you're interested in and the limits, you know, so that they're, they're not rewarded based on the numbers of people, but based on the quality of the interaction, for example, then if they believe they're doing something right, everything in their body language will communicate to the people that they're interacting with that it's right as well, and people pick up on that stuff. So, um, I kind of, the way that we work, and I'm always surprised, but I think if you're coming from the right place, people will really open themselves up to you. And I've learned, if there's one thing I've learned, everyone has a story to tell. And most of us are not given the space to tell that story. And that's a great place to start, is just you know, listening. And then take it from there. Hi, um, Rob Gillam from Human Factors International. Uh, I've had the pleasure of doing a bit of work for Nokia in the past, but largely in less exotic locations than the ones you were talking about. Um, one thing that's sort of troubled me in my work generally sometimes is I love all these examples such as you gave of emergent use of technology where people are appropriating it and using it in new and weird, wonderful ways. But it, it, these stories make me wonder whether 
despite all this research we're now doing, whether we're actually getting better at predicting what people will do with technology, whether it's helping us to know this or whether we're just documenting these things as they happen. That's a, it's a, very, it's a valid point, right? And the answer is in the stuff that then happens in the organization or doesn't happen. And some of the examples I gave you are interesting, but you would then dismiss them and they're not going anywhere. And other ones have kind of really fundamentally changed the way that we think about what it is that we're designing. You know, are we designing products or are we designing open platforms? You know, that little thing that looks like a cell phone? Is that an ATM? Is it a printer? Is it my identity? Um, so it's a fair comment and, a, and very valid, but it, on a case-by-case -case basis, um, the value is in there. Hello, I'm Aubrey Schick from Carnegie Mellon's uh, Human Computer Interaction Institute. Um, so my question was answered, and I've been standing in line kind of thinking, hmm, what's my next question going to be? And I do a lot of ethnographic research myself, and I guess the real question is, how do you get past the initial um, sense of people feeling like you don't really care about what they're doing? Like, how do you get behind that and they let you into their dirty homes? They show you their piles of, of drawings from their little sister in Brazil, you know? Okay. The <laughs> In the, so if we set up a, um, a home visit, I sure as hell know that the, someone in that home will have tidied up, right? It's not a question of if, it's uh, whether they have, it, they have, right? So that what's interesting is that when you're in that space, that you can actually move the conversation to, well, you know, actually, when we visit, we always find people tidy up. And could you tell us a little bit about what you did? And if you can actually get them to that point, them saying what they did actually gives you insights into what it is that they're trying to project to a, a relative stranger, right? So um, I think you should, what we do is in, comes with inherent biases. I think there's ways you can work around them. And we've we got a sense of whether we're seeing the real deal or whether we think actually people are putting on a front. Asking why people put on a front, either directly or indirectly with your local team, is always interesting as well. Um, I kind of, I think the way that we conduct research, I think we could probably go back to any of the participants that we've been with and say, look, would you mind if we do follow up and work with you? And I think if you can honestly say that you can do that, then you've probably built up a level of trust where, you know, things are fine, right? About how long do you spend with each person? Uh, it ranges from, um, five minutes for street to um, a day spread over a number of days, or a couple of days spread over a number of days, which also tells you something about the limits of what we can learn right, in that space of time. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Wei, and I'm from University of Illinois. I have two questions. So the first question is, I'm wondering, like, I'm very curious about how you translate those cultural differences you notice while you're doing field trips into a particular design feature or whatever. For example, like, do you have an example of like a feature you designed for a cell phone for like another country like China or India? And that feature is specific about something you notice in that specific culture. Okay. And Second uh, question can come afterwards, right? So, uh -huh. so uh, what have we done that's actually affected design? And this is the um, standard press question as well, which is, show me the money, right? So um, we can, I can show you that, and I'll come to that in a moment. But the value of this is, I think, far more strategic than simply we do this and out plops this product. And everyone in this room also recognizes the complexity of the design process and in taking all these gems of ideas into something that actually makes it into product. Um, probably the, the thing that we're most proud of is, um, from this research, is the work that we've done on illiteracy. And you, you will notice that there is not a phone on the market that is marketed at, at illiterate consumers. And one of the reasons is that illiterate people will not buy it, right? Because there's a social stigma associated with it. But our entry phones, the ones that sell in the tens, if not hundreds of millions of products, 
actually they've had a lot of the UI design has been tweaked to better support illiterate communication practices. So okay. think, uh, things like multiple address books and so it can be interchanged between cultures. Excuse me? It's so you're saying that the feature can be interchanged between cultures, right? Okay, the so at what point should you design something that's localized or versus globalized? If you're a mass producing company, it's going to be cheaper to churn out 200 million of something rather than 10 million of lots of different things that are. So most manufacturing companies are looking at standardizing as much as possible. Having said that, Nokia supports um, at least 75 um, language packs. Uh, for our devices, and so there's a lot of localization on that point of view. Um, we tend to sell products across markets. We tend not to sell one product. This is a product specifically for India, for example, um, but a, a product that's designed mostly with Indian consumers in mind, but might be sold in Pakistan, Bangladesh, even Europe as well. Thank you. Right. And my second question is actually, um, I know that there are uh, a lot of psychologists, they're trying to build up like a very systematic knowledge system of how people differ from culture to culture in terms of perception and attention, and knowledge structure, social communication. So how do you think those guidelines of systematic knowledge can be used in terms of design and uh, cultural related design and stuff like that? Okay, um, I don't know the exact research that you're referring to, so I'm not going to put my foot in it and say something about it. Um, but uh, j as much as possible, we're building multicultural design, um, kind of research teams. And frankly, without the smart people on the ground that know what's going on, you know, I'm just a, 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 a tourist essentially. And it's all for me. It's all about partnering with the smart local people. Thank you. Thank you. So. Uh, I've been really impressed throughout your talk at the degree to which you seem to have integrated moral and ethical concerns into your work, and I wanted to applaud that. But in thinking about that and about the examples that you've given, I was thinking back to an early slide that you gave where you were still having little texts popping up, and you had a little text pop up that said connected, and you said there was a particular ethical concern associated with that, and I was wondering if you would be willing to expand on that a little bit. Okay, uh, yes, good. Thanks, thanks for the comment. So, um, as researchers, where do we stop, right? So you get up in the morning, you go to your office, you do your work. If you're passionate about what you do, probably in your lunch break, you'll be searching websites. When you get home, you'll be thinking about stuff. Maybe you're writing papers to Kai. If you're like me, they'll get rejected. <laughs> so, you know, you're living it, right? And now we have lives online. And um, I think, you know, what I consider myself to be always on, as in th there is no off switch to what I do. Um, but then the people that I interact with, they're, it, they're able to then jack into my persona and your persona as well. And that really fundamentally changes the relationship with, you know, between participants or subject and you as a researcher. And it's a, it's a complex, I think I consider that a minefield that you have to tiptoe through gently before you can figure it out, figure, figure out kind of what the right course of action is. Well, so, thank you very much. Hi there, I'm Thomas Smythe from GVU Center at Georgia Tech. So you've spoken about how uh, you're rec recruiting teams of uh, local researchers to help out with your research. Um, this is something I've been getting into in my own research lately. Um, and I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about the exchange of skills that goes on, both, both from you to them and from them to you. And if you, if you in, ever end up connect, like reconnecting with them on subsequent trips and sort of uh, maybe sort of, if you have any stories about what they've done with any skills they might have gained? Okay, uh, so how, how to make the most of the relationship of uh, the team on the ground. <clears throat> So um, in the short space of time, I think the biggest challenge we have is getting everyone up to the, uh, I'm not sure if I want to call it the moral compass, but the kind of research compass of where we're heading, right? And um, they may have worked with other people with very different goals, and 
you know, it, it's not the Nokia way, but it's, you know, or maybe it is the Nokia way of, of kind of thinking about how, how to properly uh, conduct this research. And for one of the simplest things is that everyone is treated equally. And as much as possible, if you can have all the team together working, uh, living in the same space, that's a real bonus. But it's not always um, cost-wise um, possible. But certainly eating in the same space and eating the same food and eating from the same bowl, little things like that can have a really big impact in terms of um, getting rid of the them and us. Quite frankly, I can't afford them and us. That's a killer. You know, the, um, us on the team, you know, coming and jetting in, and then uh, the local team. We need to get everyone kind of together. Um, a few researchers that we've worked with have been just so spot on that we go back and uh, we um, uh, rehire them, and in fact, take them away from the environment in which they're most comfortable and give them the opportunity to working in other environments. And that's actually really rewarding, is watching people develop. I don't think I answered your question at all, but... No, it was grand, thank you. Okay. So, I'm Peter McLaughlin with Mobify. My question is, so you identified earlier as being um, revolutionary the introduction of the simplest entry-level handset, but I noticed you haven't talked a lot about uh, data or non-voice services. Is that the next revolution, or is that a revolution at all? And if it is, is it the web, or is it something else? Yeah, okay, uh, you mean the PC web, or do you mean the phone web, right? I mean, that's already... Uh, well, I contend that there's only there's actually only one web. But yeah. Okay. So, um, so uh, another one of these little announcements, and I, you know, I, you might have noticed I don't feel that comfortable about talking about my corporation that I, I work for. Sorry, comms person, but but you know, I mean, try to be agnostic a bit. But something that's I think really gone unnoticed in the press is that Nokia is rolling out email basically on all our handsets. And I think the Nokia messaging service offers email even through kind of very basic low fidelity data channels like SMS, um, but it appears as an email inbox. But, I mean, that's huge in terms of thinking, in, in terms of the web, right? And if you think of all the things that you can do with an email account in terms of memory, in terms of a store, um, portability, uh, and so on. So. Uh, Again, I don't think I answered the question, but thank you. Yeah. Hi, first, thank you. It was a wonderful talk. Um, I don't have a question, but more of a comment. Um, it, just listening to the questions, listening to your talk, there's a sense that you have to go to these exotic places to experience the things that you've seen. And sometimes that can be intimidating or out of reach for some people. But um, I just think it's useful to remind people that there are these opportunities to see these types of things you've been talking around all around us. Uh, I mean, I had a manicure yesterday where everybody spoke in Vietnamese, and there was a shrine on the wall that was very different from what I've used to see. And it, um, I'm in Atlanta, and we have a huge immigrant communities and um, I can drive 40 miles up the road and go to a church service that's unlike nothing I've ever seen where I have people taking de removing demons from me during exorcisms and just to remind people that you don't have to travel million thousands of miles but just look around you for these opportunities yeah uh, I think it's just a way of thinking about the world around you right and questioning everything as well I should point out that some of the more exotic places my company doesn't send me to. I just go because I want to do it and I think it's the right thing to do. So places like Afghanistan, you know, I went, I took a vacation and I figured out how to do it and I went there and I did the research, right? And um, I think that kind of becomes a quid quo pro for the company because, you know, maybe you and maybe they think that actually it is part of the whole, this is what we're doing formally. And it shifts people, my, people's mindset to, hey, we can do that which means that the next time you want to do it, it's more acceptable, and people will assume that actually, yeah, we can do this. So that's a kind of never say no, right? Or never take no for an answer. Hi, Anne. Uh, last question. For, yeah. Um, you did a wonderful job talking about sort of the collection steps you go through, and I wanted to hear a little bit more about the synthesis that, goes, that happens next. Does it happen still in loco, or does it happen back in LA? Um, and sort of how do you start thinking about presenting this so, so how, how best to synthesize these kind of massive volumes of data that we're collecting? Um, first off, a lot of the team will be flying in from different places. And so much of the syn synthesis has to happen in the field. And we just work our butts off every night you know, until we pass out, basically. We're working on this stuff and iterating it. 
So it's quite a high pressure cooker environment. Um, another thing is that before we leave, everyone on the team needs to have a shared understanding of what it is that we've experienced. You know, it's a first draft understanding, but everyone needs that um, understanding. So on a logistical um, level, we've actually created a process for bringing in pretty large volumes of data and getting it to the point that when we leave, everyone has a copy of that data in a format that is usable and understandable. And if a complete stranger was to walk up to that data set, anyone in the team could direct them to the right interview, the right photo, and so on. So it's, it's not sexy, but um, it's the stuff that allows us to do the kind of much more creative work, getting those processes right. Thank you. So I, I think I've been up here for way enough. I just would like to say thank you to Robert and Kai and yourselves for sitting through this. Yeah.